Jesse Delic friends, welcome back to the Pleasure Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. But before we go any further, remember to like, share, and subscribe, especially on Spotify because we're working really hard to grow that. Today, our special guest is none other than Gomu Sikyon Pembasimula. In today's episode, we talk about Gomu Sikyon's favorite food. We talk about the stress of being Sikyon, the headache, the challenges that come with it. But we also talk about the responsibilities that us youths bear. Thank you so much to Gomu Sikyon Pembasimula. Thank you so much to Tsirinla, Juju Losan Gerela, Takwala, Tsirinla, and everyone else who made this rare opportunity possible. Thank you. In other news, this episode is sponsored by KarmaCare. KarmaCare is a leading provider of elderly care for yourself, for your partner, or for your loved ones. KarmaCare provides compassionate care, but they're also there to build genuine relationships with you and your loved ones. So, if you or your loved one is ever in need of care, call Karma Care, the number one elderly service in Virginia. Thank you so much, Karma, for sponsoring this video. Welcome, Welcome to, to Pidja Podcast. Real ah. name. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining Pidja Podcast from the bottom of our heart. So to start off, we just wanted to let you know that our audience happens to be the younger Tibetan generation. And our goal for this episode is that many of us know what a Sikyong is and what a Sikyong does. But you know, at Pidja, we want to show and convey the message of who the Sikyong is. And because we believe that people get more inspired by the person rather than the position. So once again, welcome to the CEO of the And just to get started off with a light question, what's mm-hmm. your favorite Tibetan dish? Favorite Tibetan dish? Uh, I've had so many dishes. Uh, one of the things that my family makes for me is Jetu and Rishangale. That's also a combination that not many people have, mm-hmm. but it's a nice combination. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think uh, laughing is my favorite. I'm not sure if that's a Tibetan dish, but I hope that doesn't uh, uh, push conservation. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm Shambhu, so I'll probably say Kitsu Momo or Shogu Momo. Mm-hmm. I like that a lot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, Sikyong, Pajana. I mean, just to segue a little bit, um, I think, you know, any sort of leadership position is one of like a thankless job sometimes. Could you talk a little bit about like the sacrifices or like the consequences of being Sikh, you know, like being away from family for so long, um, maybe the stress of the job, you know, there's always a controversy or news that comes up, how do you deal with that? Could you give us a little bit of an insight <coughs> on like the different types of you know, stress or consequences that you have to go through and how you deal with that? Mm-hmm. I think it's very important that you have uh, family support for your job, because if there is no harmony at home, then it's very difficult to function. So fortunately for me, my immediate family, my brothers, sisters, all of them are very supportive and they don't disturb me by calling me all the time. So I don't have to be concerned that I have forgotten to call my relatives or they are not calling me. So that's not there. That obligation is not there. Uh, They take it for granted that I'm busy and they don't disturb me. And of course, I keep my... uh, I keep, uh, even though my family is in Toronto right now, Mm -hmm. uh, I keep calling them very Mm -hmm. often. And uh, that's the way uh, we keep it going. Uh, It's very, only a few times in a year, or one time or two times in a year that I get to meet them. Uh, But they have been very supportive. Mm -hmm. So that uh, is also one reason that keeps pushing me in doing the job. Because you said thankless job. Uh, sometimes you might, but then uh, the motivation of your joining or taking up the job is not to be thanked by people. Uh, you are there because you think you can do a job, a good job of it, and then uh, uh, you don't seek uh, acknowledgement from, from people that you are doing well. But then, of course, we live in a society, we are all social animals, appreciations, or Denigrations are part of life, and uh, I've learned to take criticism uh, head on. 
Uh, I always keep telling people, whatever you have to say, uh, say it in meetings. Uh, people come and receive us at the airport, in long lines, so many hours you have to spend waiting and all that. This is not something that I'm not really appreciative about, but then of course people do that on their own and uh, I can't stop them. But I always tell them to come for meetings. That's important. That's when we speak our mind. That's when public also asks their questions directly. So once I'm left, gone from that place, then I say, I, know, I don't care right, about whatever you say. Yeah. When I'm there, you should speak out. Mm-hmm. Whether it makes sense or doesn't make sense, doesn't matter. Because everybody has a different mental disposition and inclination. Right. And everybody has their experience of going up. So every single person in this world out of eight billion are different. Everybody is physically different, everybody is mentally different. So differences of opinion is natural. So if once you understand that, then you don't feel the pain of listening to people who say different things because they're speaking out uh, from what they know. So it also reflects their ignorance or knowledge of what they're speaking about. So based on that, you understand that, okay, this person knows only so much or this person knows much more. So mm-hmm. accordingly, you react. Mm-hmm. That does not necessarily mean to say, as you are elected as Sigon, that does not necessarily mean to say that I know everything. I have to keep learning every single day about the new developments internationally in China, in Tibet, uh, and then see how best uh, we can use those opportunities. So, yes, it is a tough job, and not just the Sikong, but the whole Central Tibetan administration's uh, uh, salary is also not as much as it should be. Or, uh, so people here are not working for salary, mm-hmm. they are working for the cost. So the job satisfaction that you derive uh, from doing these kind of jobs is immense. Mm-hmm. It's, it's incomparable to any other job that you might do or you might take up. So. Uh, that is what keeps us pushing, and then of course you have His Holiness the Dalai Lama, uh, who, who has always been uh, keeping the spirit of the Tibetans alive, whether it's Tibetans inside or Tibetans outside, or Tibet supporters all around the world. Nobody thought that we would have to live in exile for so long when our parents or your grandparents came here. But then uh, now it has been 63 years. And sometimes uh, for Tibetans, for some Tibetans maybe, and for Tibet supporters, uh, they develop fatigue after supporting Tibet for so long. So we have to make sure that we keep people informed about the developments inside Tibet. So for that you have to understand as much as possible. So if you don't know uh, yourself, then you can't speak to others about what's happening. So challenges are there, but then when you join the election when you decided decide to stand for election from that time onwards or before that uh, you should be prepared for the challenges you, you should be aware of your challenges uh, then take on one should take on the job and then you say I have probably with problems with family is that and it doesn't work so you talked about fatigue do you ever get fatigue or even worse um, lose hope about the Tibetan cause never ever never, never ever that's why His Holiness mm-hmm. kept us alive in pushing our, uh, or achieving our objective mm-hmm. in uh, finding a resolution to the Sino Tibet conflict. Mm-hmm. So, if we lose hope, then all else will lose hope. Uh, of course, we have this Tibetan saying that Chinese uh, uh, are very suspicious, and uh, Tibetans are always uh, too hopeful. Uh, but without hope, then the uh, cause itself would vanish. Mm. Yeah. Without hope, or there won't be struggle. Yeah. Uh, if there is no struggle, then there won't be a continuation of the movement. Yeah. So hope is something we have to keep alive. Even now, I keep telling the Tibet supporters wherever we travel, sometimes they say, oh, it has been so long, now you don't hear about Tibet much, uh, other issues are taking over. Uh, that we are just losing hope also because His Holiness is uh, now aging and he's not able to travel as much as he used to do before. Mm, but we keep telling them we have not lost, lost hope. Uh, 
Tibetans inside Tibet still continues to be uh, very, very committed uh, to their cause. So, to the spirit of the Tibetans inside Tibet are alive, then our movement also will have to continue. Yeah. And I'm glad that, you know... If I can just okay, ask yeah, before, go ahead. Um, just quickly, sorry, before we move on to the next topic. Um, this is like a, just like a personal question out mm -hmm. of curiosity. Um, so you mentioned how um, you know, every single eight billion of us are different, but uh, Gyalamji always says, you know, common, uh, the commonality in human beings, everyone is pretty much the same. How do you, how do you balance those two thoughts? I feel like a lot in Buddhism, there's a lot of like this balancing, maybe a bit, uh, for example, there's about the mind aspect and there's a wisdom aspect. How do you balance those two, when you, that, that philosophy? The reason why I say the, the come, uh -huh. It's mental uh, disposition and inclination that everybody is different. Mm. But then the commonality that His Holiness is talking about is the intelligence mm. of human beings. So mm. every single person has the intelligence mm. to achieve what they want to achieve. Uh, just recently I was in Australia and you have the Aboriginals uh, who lived there for 55, 60,000 years in the past. And when the white people came in, they were not even considered as human beings. Mm -hmm. You also hear stories about his holiness having gone to African mm -hmm. continent, and many Africans believe that they cannot be equal to white people. Mm -hmm. So that is not the truth. Mm -hmm. Every single human being on this earth is the same. They all have the same brain, mm -hmm. and they have the intelligence. Mm -hmm. That is the commonality. I see. Okay. So now, how do you develop your intelligence to further your cause? or your endeavor is different. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's a quote, I think, that goes, you know, we all may look different, but at the end of the day, we all still bleed red. And I think that's a great That's analogy. why it's all this message of oneness of humanity. Right. Because humanity is one. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of animals in this world. So you, when you talk about ecology, environment, and all that, and balance, and all that, then mm -hmm. all, every single insect is valuable right. to maintain the ecological balance. Mm, or a, a, a single animal is uh, important, uh, but then at the same time you cannot influence them because they don't have the intelligence like humans. Uh -huh. So the only beings that can be influenced are the humans that has mm -hmm. uh, intelligence like uh, no other animal right. uh, in this world. So that is why we are different and that's why humanity is different. And mm -hmm. Unless uh, you accept the uh, oneness of humanity as a concept and also the interdependence of our uh, nature, the interdependent nature of our existence, mm -hmm. uh, then you don't understand the holistic uh, picture mm -hmm. of the world and how to address uh, universal challenges. Um, so yeah, we're going to move on to the next topic. Mm -hmm. But as Yigongula mm -hmm. talked about the stress of your job, and you know, the pressures that come with being Sikyong. Um, the last time we met, which was actually about three days ago with the Sarah Lopetsu, um, we talked about disagreements in the Tibetan community and how although not everyone may agree on everything, we must stay united as one, as we all have a common goal at the end of the day. So I've already asked, sort of asked you this question before in the past, but I kind of want to ask again so the viewers can hear. But um, can you further elaborate or how can we create or what are some possible solutions to create unity within the Tibetan community? despite all these things that are growing or have been pertaining for so many years. Now, it has to come from within you. Right. Nobody can force unity upon you. And for that, every single Tibetan individual is important. And every single Tibetan has to ask this question to oneself. Mm -hmm. First, as a Tibetan, you are a Tibetan, you can't deny that you are a Tibetan, whether you are American citizen or European citizen or wherever. In this life, as His Holiness says, your blood, your, uh, you know, your, because uh, you're born, everything is Tibetan. Yeah. This life, at least. Next life, you're born in some other family, it's a different matter. So, as a Tibetan, uh, uh, if everybody understands that we have a larger responsibility compared to people from independent countries, uh, our countries occupy it. And we have a responsibility to our brothers and sisters who continue to suffer inside Tibet. Then you have to think how best you can do it, uh, how best you can contribute. Because your capacities are varied, uh, people's capacities are different at uh, different levels. Otherwise, everybody would be single. Uh, you know, or, you know, so yeah. So in, in, 
need that. So for unity, uh, what I have always adopted, even when I was Speaker of the Parliament, we had the Standing Committee of all the religious tradition and provincial uh, representatives. And I always tell them, uh, I don't like to fight over smaller issues that could be waxed, mm -hmm. but that creates a lot of uh, distrust and disharmony and also hampers the larger issues. We are all fighting over smaller issues all the time right. and that impacts decisions on yes. important issues. Mm -hmm. so that's why uh, I never try to fight over smaller issues. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, you know, it doesn't, some smaller issues doesn't have that much of an impact. Mm -hmm. well, that's okay. But wherever there is impactful, then we have to be careful in how or what decisions we make. So we cannot just depend on your closeness or proximity to a province or to a religious tradition or to your own home place. Uh, of course, you have to, as a Pivekena, like as Shangos, that will always be there. If we belong if we belong to the same DC area when we meet outside, we say, oh yeah, we are from DC or Virginia, Virginia. <laughs> Virginia, DC, all that. Then you have the larger United States. So if you reach uh, Timbuktu where nobody lives or you don't know anybody, then you find somebody from the United States and you feel happy that yeah, you, 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 you were. So similarly, you have a sense of belonging to a certain community or affiliation to a certain yeah, organization. But then when you grow up, and if you think about the larger picture, Mm -hmm. Even when we were younger, I used to hate the Chinese just like every Tibetan does because yeah. we have a hold of every Chinese responsible right. for okay. the situation inside Tibet. But then His Holiness started talking about compassion, love, mm -hmm. you know, and people who are being bad to you to look yeah. them as masters. Yeah. Without them, you can't practice yeah. how to control anger or you know jealousy and all those kind of things. So we can't. 100% behave or think like His Holiness who is a Bodhisattva. Yeah. But then to whatever level we can reach mm -hmm. in terms of not even using the word enemy uh, against China, but as opponent, as Professor Samdhan Ramchi used to say. Yeah. All these small, small things also have its... Uh, yeah. 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 And then just to quickly follow up on that, yeah. Um, yeah. do you think it's a Tibetan thing or like a human behavior thing where like people are focused on the small, small pictures that might not have big, big impact, but rather than focusing on the big picture, because Gyalamji's commitments in itself are a big picture. And then the second question to that is, um, you know, how did you move from a, you know, like a Rangzin, uh, I mean, everybody wants Rangzin in a way, to actually... Let's keep that separate. Maybe we'll handle the first question okay. first, right? Yeah. Now, that also depends on company. Okay. Again, how even a twin mm -hmm. who is born together maybe one few seconds, one two minutes before or after, born from the same mother, they will not be the same people. Mm -hmm. Even if they live all their life. I have three twins. Oh. Uh, sis my three sisters have three twins. Yeah. So no. I know <laughs> they are not. Every single incident, even if we do live together all our life, there may be cases where she has experience, where I don't have. So this, that's why it's when you have bigger responsibilities, then you try to understand more. When you have not too many responsibilities, then you think only about your surrounding mm -hmm. people that are close to you. So you fight with people close to you, you love people who are close to you, or you remain indifferent. That's mm -hmm. what uh, whole society is all about. Mm -hmm. You can't everybody, every every human being to love you, or you mm -hmm. can't expect every human being to hate you. But then you have to build towards that. So the idea is, how do you uh, make yourself understand the holistic picture, and then see how you fit in into that uh, uh, maze. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's how you have to define yourself. Otherwise, at your level of understanding, at whatever age, or whatever qualification, or whatever experience, you are talking about that, that does not necessarily need to be the truth. So uh, if you have a greater comprehension of all the elements, then you can always come out with better solutions also, whenever you face challenges. So one of our job is, uh, as, as political leader or uh, taking care of the welfare of Tibetans, is always you have people coming 
But whenever they come, you know they have a problem. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, they don't come. Yeah. So our mind has to work towards how do we respond to these uh, problems. Mm-hmm. So you have to understand the laws. Because I always tell my staff, first look at two things. When a problem comes to you, first you decide whether it's in accordance with law or not. Mm-hmm. If it is not in accordance with law, then you can't need, don't need to touch it or it's very easy to decide. Mm-hmm. If it is in accordance with law, then you take up the matter. Mm-hmm. Then also, you, if it is, it is a problem that's related to money, you make sure there is budget provision for that mm-hmm. or not. So once you check these two, then you're legally sound. <laughs> in terms of what you're doing within the framework of because democracy is all about laws mm-hmm. and uh, regulations. So once you conform to this, then you look at the problem and see how do you because everything boils down ultimately to emotions. Mm-hmm. It's all yeah. so all human human relations are emotions. Mm-hmm. Everything right. boils down to whether you're speaking to thousands or hundreds of thousands of people or few people, everything boils down to emotions. Mm-hmm. I think, yeah, like another follow-up question would be like, what does being Tibetan mean to you? Because I think for a lot of us, especially the younger generation, it means power, it means resistance, especially, you know, with the teachings of Gyaran Bache, um, we've learned to really just kind of be one and just really show everyone who we are as Tibetans. So what does being Tibetan mean to you, I guess? Uh, physically, there are many people who look, look like us <laughs> within India, you have Northeast India. Yeah. You have Nepal, the Himalayan region, you have the whole Southeast Asia, East Asia, maybe even to some extent uh, Central Asia, people who look like us. So eyes, nose, mouth, your physical features are more for other studies. Uh, that, uh, mm, Oh, okay. What does being Tibetan mean to you? Mm. What makes us different is our culture, mm. uh, is our way of life. And that is dictated by uh, spirituality. If, it is, if you are somebody who follows spirituality or if you are an uh, atheist, then it's a different matter. So, uh, for Tibetans, uh, as His Holiness always says, Tibetan Buddhist culture mm. uh, that is rooted in compassion, uh, rooted in non-violence, has a lot of potential for this world, which is a violence-driven world. Uh, yeah. Oh, by the way, how much time do we have so we can just see how much questions we can cut out? And then, um, just pivoting a little bit, our main audience, target audience, is the youth. About 80% of our audience between the age of 35, to, sorry, 18 to 35. Um, with that said, you've been in politics in a while. Since you were very young, you had potential. You graduated top of your class. You ran for Jitu very young. One, would you still recommend that path? Uh, and two, like, what inspired you? Would you? And what other options do we have as Tibetans, young Tibetans, to uh, support the cause? I always recount this uh, story of His Holiness, uh, the Professor Sangdan uh, when we invited him to speak to the younger generations of Tibetans about their responsibilities. Uh, Professor Rinpoche spent about one hour said nothing about responsibilities mm. uh, or what are the responsibilities of the youth but he just explained the two words uh, in Tibetan the word Nengi mm. and the English word responsibility if it is translated as responsibility so Nengi is something that comes from within you mm. nobody asks you to do anything mm. and you do it on your own because you know that this is your responsibility mm. uh, Responsibility, the word responsibility in English comes from the word response. Oh. So that is, if somebody asks you to do something, then you respond. Right. Right. It's an that's, yeah, that's actually, yeah. That's yeah. Cool. So the difference in, in understanding of these two words, lenge and responsibility, mm-hmm. which is spoke for about an hour, just mm-hmm. explaining these two words. And finally, he said, I am also a Tibetan, you are also a Tibetan, the Tibetan youth. So nobody told me what my responsibility was. Mm-hmm. I developed it on my own. So it is upon you to decide what your responsibilities are. Mm-hmm. 
it's not another Tibetan who should be telling what your responsibilities are. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a very striking argument. Mm -hmm. uh, very nice to put it. You know. So even for us, of course, encouragement was there when we were younger, when we used to work on the fields, go to school, do all kind of odd jobs. You don't have to do this. Your generation didn't have to do this. So uh, having uh, gone, gone through uh, all this, uh, uh, it imbibes or inculcates in you a certain kind of responsibility when you hear it. And the Tibetans have this bad hang. Uh, bad uh, habit of saying uh, when elders are talking, kids should not be able to go play, you know, when the elders are talking. Yeah. That, I think is, that is, I think, is a very long perception. Because, uh, the younger you are, the more you listen to it. Your, your body is like a computer. The more you put in, that more you can process. So the more you hear, the more you see for yourself, observe, and all that. Which, we are, you are a generation that has not seen Tibet. I'm of the generation that has never seen Tibet. And your generation have now access to Google, Google Earth and all that you can Chagibiti. see. Chagibiti. Chagibiti. <laughs> and now, of course, uh, where it will lead to, we don't know. So, our days, we have no television, uh, nothing. We yeah. just listen to stories and imagine mountains and valleys and rivers and all that yeah. in Tibet. So now, at least, you can go on Google Earth and, you know, see for yourself which is where so when you have the facilities people don't go for mm. don't even look at mm. you know younger generations if you ask not you two but then others many others if you ask them where you are coming from where parents are coming from which part of today they don't know yeah. many of them don't and that's that i think the fault also lies in the parents from mm. not telling the stories mm. to the children so that's how stories are passed down from generations to generations to keep them involved. Mm -hmm. yeah. In you personally, what was what did you feel was your language when you ran for Chitu in the beginning? No, those concept, days yeah. uh, when we first when I first joined Chitu, that was way back in nineteen ninety six. I was about twenty nine, thirty years old. Wow. And uh, there have been others, like our Tejula, Jerry Kamala, wow. they have become members at 25. Actually, my mom uh, was a too during that time. Yeah. <laughs> so, but we had, and then your mom, mom must have also told you, we didn't have much of election campaign. Mm. It's mostly some leaders in Taramsala who just decides and sends list of people to the, uh, you know, uh, this, this, we have no campaign, not, not even sent one, spent one cent on campaigning, not, no distribution of papers, nothing. It's just uh, by word of mouth in the community, as this person is good or that person is not good, so they vote like that. Yeah. And uh, throughout my life uh, in Parliament, I've never campaigned. So once I won, then I got re-elected again in 2001, 2006, 2011, 20 years. Consecutively, uh, that also depends on how you function in the parliament and what, what role do you uh, try to play. But then, of course, those days, the motivation of joining the parliament and not the executive was because executive, it would take very long time to reach the top. Mm. At least, uh, during, even in parliament also, not everybody can become the speaker or the deputy speaker, mm. you have only one. Yeah. So, uh, there, at least, you have more power of oversight, mm. even though it's not as much as the U.S. Congress. Right. Uh, ours is a combination of both presidential and parliamentary system right. together. So, yes, the, the will to do something and also the, to have the freedom to do on your own. Yeah. Uh, if you're within the bureaucracy, you have to act according to the uh, policies and programs of the government. But within the parliament, of course, you have to follow that, but you have more the oversight job. Mm -hmm. So you're not restricted to one department where mm -hmm. you work yeah. for five, ten years, but you have oversight over everything. Mm -hmm. So with my uh, background as an economic student, uh, that also allowed me some leverage on accounting systems, which I used to do personally for the company that uh, we used to run in Pondicherry and uh, then adapt it to the CTA's budget uh, system and see how to understand that. So there are very few Tibetans who understand the whole budgetary system mm -hmm. those days. Okay. So a few of us who knows about this used to be in the budget estimate committee almost every year. So we, through that, 
just being in one community helps you in the overall understanding of how much money is coming in and how much is being distributed uh, you know, for service delivery. So this gives you much more understanding of the holistic uh, situation of the Central Development Administration. That gives you much more leverage to think about. You know, once you understand the whole picture, then it gives you more space to think about. If you understand only so much, then your mind is blocked by a lot of things that you don't know. Right. Yeah. And just quickly to follow up, one personal question that I have is, um, so I went to a community college first. There I ran for my student body president. I success successfully won. Mm -hmm. I transferred to University of Virginia. I ran for a student body president there. I unsuccessfully won. <laughs> I, I lost. So I was, I, you've talked a lot about why you ran for a CP. <coughs> so let's, we can put that aside. But then could you talk about the campaigning experience? Maybe like a little dive deep into like the str the strategy a little bit of campaigning, especially in like it was more most mostly a virtual experience, right? Uh, in two thousand eleven, uh, there were uh, uh, people asking me to stand, but I did stand, but not a serious candidate. In two thousand sixteen, we went up to the preliminary. Uh, that was also like usual uh, campaign, going to Tibetan settlements and speaking to people. But then of course. One of the huge challenges that you have here in our system is we don't have political parties. So you're on your own. Mm. If you are standing for Zijong, if you are standing for Zijong, you're on your own. You have to create your own network. Yeah. There's no governmental support. There is no political party, people to work for you. So 2016 was a stepping stone for me. And then 2021, uh, when I came, uh, back to India after my stint, short stint, and the, the, the issues that went on in our Supreme Justice Commission, the case number 20 and all that. Mm. Uh, I take every development as a blessing in disguise. Mm. Because during that period, that period gave me a little time mm. to read. Yes. So I read a lot of documents mm. of foreigners who visited Tibet. Mm. So now I have a lot more better understanding of Tibetan history and mm. contemporary history. Uh, Comparative history, uh, for that matter. So this helps me now to, when I go to Australia, I can see, speak about Australia, Tibet relation with Italy, with anybody in the, the whole world. So this also gives you uh, much more leverage in, in small talks, breaking eyes, you know, talk about things in the past that connects you from people to people emotionally. So all these things help me. Uh, so I don't consider those years as wasted years. That those have been very, very helpful for being me uh, now. So 2021, uh, February, I came back to India. And then 15 days after that, there was lockdown in India because of the pandemic. So I was wondering how to spend my time. Once, of course, one is, of course, to focus on reading listening to his holiness teachings all the time. Same teaching. If you listen to it 10 times, you learn something you new. Every time there is something to learn. You, know, yeah. so you miss out something, then you go, this is, this, his holiness means this by that, you know. So all those kind of things help in shaping your mind as to how to face challenges. Mm. So in that same sense, you have this nuggets of with this wisdom. Mm. Like if there is a problem that you know you have a solution, then why worry? Yeah. If there is a problem you know you don't have a solution, then why worry also? Mm. So those kind of things, you know, you know there is a challenge, but you know that there is no immediate solution. Mm. But if you keep rolling, thinking about this over and over again, then you will definitely find a solution. Mm. Just like day and night. Without night, there is no day. If mm. there is no day, there is no night. So if there is no problem, there is no solution. Yeah. When there is a problem, there is definitely a solution. But the question is, what is the best solution? And how fast you can get it, or when you can do it? You know, these kind of things. Yeah. So, if you have those understandings, then it makes your life much more easier. Mm -hmm. Even in the parliament, I call it my retreat session. Because, uh, <laughs> when people speak in different languages and voices and sense or no sense. Uh, uh, if you are able to practice, think that, okay, this person is saying based on his background, this mm. thinking, that thinking, or he may be saying this because he may have been asked by somebody to say that. So when you understand that, you lose that uh, anger towards that person. Mm. So you, you uh, that is the essence of uh, practice of Buddhism. 
So during the last election, there was pandemic. I spent about seven months. I slept in the farm, in the field. I like cotton fields, so oh, sure. I slept in the field for about eight, nine months by myself. Uh, and then I have my huge family there, so we built a house there. We nice. spent a lot of time picking up stones and bricks <laughs> and you know, all that. For seven months, I did work hard for 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, made up for that. That was physically really uh, satisfying yeah. uh, that you yeah. did something and that you have a house ready after seven months. So all those were there. People were asking me, is it not too late for you to make an announcement now? It's already begun in July, August, and I asked them, are people still talking about paper standing or not standing? They said yes, so that itself is enough. Mm -hmm. awesome. We don't need to go out and speak because maybe I have one advantage uh, compared to others. If people know about me mm -hmm. through the case number 20, through my uh, me being kicked out of the office and all that. So there was also a lot of sympathy factor. And when I was speaker for Seven and a half years I used to travel around the settlements, so I know some people. Uh, then, of course, uh, because of these issues, people know about me, so it's not necessary that I go to the people to speak to them. And we took some principal position. One is that I will not take part in any debates. The US kind of debates, where you have presidential elections there and then. You know, yeah. All that uh, U.S. need not necessarily be, necessarily be the best example of democracy. So democracy itself is divisive in nature. When you have election, you can vote for anyone. Yeah. You can't vote for two people. Yeah. Right? So it is divisive. But then the understanding within the Tibetan population should be that you nobody can force you to vote for somebody. It's your individual right. Mm -hmm. Not even a committee or not even a community can ask you. You maybe you, you maybe discuss. Maybe you can discuss with your family, friends, and see who is the best. But then the decision is ultimately yours. Mm. So instead of focusing more on slandering people and other things, you you speak about the good things of of your candidate, not create problems. Mm. Uh, and once the election is over, people should understand that this is a process that is done. So we can't keep fighting over an election that yeah. happened five years or ten years before. Mm -hmm. So we have to learn to move ahead uh, after election. So these are some things. Uh, but I was fortunate that I didn't, I, with these principles stand, one, not to have uh, uh, open public uh, Debate. big debates, because when you say that, and if the other person lies, I cannot take lies. Oh. So I have to point it out. And if I do that, then the other candidates who doesn't like it, or his or her supporters don't like it. So it's better that you speak about yourself, what you want to do. And also the fact that since the pandemic was going on, we didn't want to physically meet with people. And even if whether I may get a few more votes or less votes, I don't know. But you are going on the hope that you will get some more votes. But for some votes, if you do some lives, that will be too risky. Uh, too, too much of a loss for us. That's why I decided not to undertake. Even at Bailukupi, where I was living and the settlement that I belonged to, I didn't speak to these people. Wow. So this, I think, we now uh, have learned a new lesson. And in future, if the election commission, the commission is willing, they are looking into the possibility of developing an app uh, where uh, Tibetans, if, even if they are one, even if there is only one bit in one country and that person is eligible for voting, we should make it possible for that person to vote, to make it inclusive, uh, to bring um, in that kind of people awesome. as possible. Um, yeah, just being mindful of time, um, but you talk about slandering and stuff, mm -hmm. and I think some people might be wondering why we're doing this episode in English or why Pija is so heavily English focused. I'm sure there will be some type of discourse <laughs> about that. Um, but, you know, I think that it's because we are the modern day ambassadors for Tibet. Um, we want to share the message of Tibet with a larger population, but also, you know, we want to be more inclusive to those who may have grown up in the West with little to no Tibetans, or those who may have gone to Indian and Nepali schools since childhood, <coughs> or um, as well as mixed Tibetans who may have grown up with two different cultures. Um, and um, I wanted to highlight this because, you know, there was a recent incident where my friends and I um, had a personal experience where we were told we were not, and I quote, Tibetan enough because we were speaking, you know, bits of English here and there. 
Um, but you know, we all came together to learn about our culture, about Tibetan and Nolshu and La Rukshu and um, for example, I'm, I'm currently going to Sarah College and you know, it's been a wonderful experience so far, but it can be sometimes unmotivating when you hear stuff like that. So what are your thoughts about stuff like this and do you have any personal advice for people who may have gone through something like this as well? For uh, people at different stages of life, mm -hmm. uh, they have different experiences, as I said. So based on their thinking, uh, sometimes they become judgmental. Mm -hmm. uh, there a lot of other things, uh, not yourself. Uh, introspection is very important. First, you look at yourself and judge yourself before you judge others. Mm -hmm. uh, that is uh, very important. Very often, people don't do that. People don't see one's own mistake, but always like to point finger at others. Uh, that is one thing. Now, we live uh, in a totally different environment, not like our parents used to live in Tibet, or not like how we were you in the beginning of our uh, exile uh, period. So those days we were all together, mm -hmm. compact communities, uh, and that was the only way to do it. To, to and the Indian Prime Minister was also very kind mm -hmm. to suggest to his holiness that if you want to preserve your culture, then it's very important to give education to the younger generations of Tibetans. So because of that, we managed to establish our schools, monastic institution, all that. So that is why compact communities are important to preserve our identity. When we talk about identity, then we talk about our language, our culture, religion, and all that. Of course, language is important. Then again, now we have a changing demographic, uh, changing uh, social scenario. You know, a lot more people, younger people are moving out. So that, again, presents a lot of opportunities as well as challenges. So one of the challenges was, of course, the younger generations of Tibetans who were born and brought up in Europe or North America live in a totally different uh, environment and it's difficult for them to pick up Tibetan as much as possible. But there are some basic things which we have learned uh, over the years, over the last 50, 60 years. First, we sent some Tibetans to Switzerland, some Tibetans to Denmark, then some Tibetans to Canada in this early 70s. And lately, you have these thousand Tibetans to US, Canada, ongoing program with uh, a migration program with Australia. Now, this time, what I found a little different from the Tibetan youth in US and Canada, uh, North America and Europe, compared to Australia is because they speak better Tibetan than all the youth. You did Australia in Australia. Australia. Oh, I see. That's we got competition. One of the, <laughs> the reasons could be because we moved families from here. Mm, okay. you, uh, one person gets selected, the whole family gets to move. So in the US and Europe, many singular people went, or people went mm -hmm. by themselves, or when we sent also, we sent one person from one family. So you have the remaining family here in India, mm -hmm. children out there, here, you know, so when you are younger, you also end up in a lot of problems with the uh, relationships and all that. So that is that was different in Australia. That's what I found this yeah. time. Uh, they, they, they see. So it, what ultimately matters, even you facing, we face the same criticism when I was speaking to the children, we thought that <laughs> since all the students are coming from uh, Europe and North America, <laughs> Maybe they may not understand all of it, so I was trying to mix Tibetan and English yeah, both. Yeah. And uh, the two uh, people who are accompanying the Belgian students, they complained about uh, us uh, not speaking complete uh, Tibetan, yeah. full Tibetan. Yeah. So those perceptions will always remain. Mm -hmm. But what is important is to remain a good person. Mm -hmm. So whether you are an American or you are a European, if you bring out the best uh, within yourself, whether you are a Buddhist or not, that also doesn't matter. That's why His Holiness is speaking about ethics yeah. as, as an important component of teaching. So you have social, emotional, and ethical mm -hmm. learning. So which is sea learning, right? sea learning yes. which is not meant only for believers. It's meant all also for non-believers. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about 1.4 billion Chinese. Mm -hmm. They are also a target of the sea learning. Mm -hmm. Uh, every person does not necessarily be a religious person, even for that matter, a particular religion amongst all that. So I don't think uh, Tibetans who can't speak Tibetan uh, should feel inferior or be excluded in any way. When I was in uh, Denmark this time, 
uh, you know Denmark and all the Scandinavian countries have very strict immigration laws. Mm -hmm. So most of the Tibetans who arrive there are married to non tibetans and all their children are mixed heritage and they all live in very different uh, environments. So it's very difficult. Some some of them do speak good Tibetan, but otherwise, uh, you know. so you have Tibetans who don't speak Tibetan, uh, uh, Tibetans who are of mixed heritage. Mm -hmm. So all those are things uh, there. Now, as a state, as a government or as an administration, our job has to be inclusive in nature. You know, so, uh, but then the primary base uh, depends on the family. Because as a child, for your food, milk, everything you need your parents. Mm -hmm. So you speak only in Tibetan, those formative years. At least those things will remain there. And when you grow up a little bit, and if you want to give some interest, at least the basic is there. If that basic is not, the people are talking about different problems once children uh, are reached the age of six, five or six, when they start going to school, then they lose yeah. education. Now we have weekend classes, but when children reach the age of grade nine, ten, then they have a lot more homework yeah. in the schools, so they don't come to uh, you know, continue. So those problems are there. Uh, of course, I know of one girl in uh, Switzerland. Uh, where she used to be told by her parents to study Tibetan, speak Tibetan, and you know, uh, as a young uh, child, oh, then suddenly you become very um, uh, rebellious. Yeah, the reverse psychology <laughs> <laughs> happened. You know, so, but later, she was she was very much uh, as a teen. She was going against her parents mm. uh, to speak only in German or whatever, mm. and then later. I met her when she had grown up, maybe bigger than you right now. And she started leading the Tibetan community. And for that, she thought it's necessary to learn Tibetan. And she learned, and today she can get up on stage and speak in Tibetan to the general public. Mm -hmm. So I think there also has to be some effort mm -hmm. from yeah, the Tibetans yes. who didn't, it's not because of their mistake, their fault. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's because of circumstances, environment, parents, mm -hmm. everybody involved. You know, so yeah, it is good if you know, but that that does not make make you less Tibetan just yeah. because you don't speak Tibetan. But yeah. then Tibetan is also one important component of Tibetan identity. But language is a tool. Mm -hmm. What is actually should the value should be in your head mm -hmm. and your heart. Mm -hmm. So their language doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You are you may be very good in Tibetan, but if you are doing everything against the course of Tibetan, then it doesn't help you to become a Tibetan and no Tibetan right. language. Yeah. But if you don't speak Tibetan also, but if you can work hard for the Tibetan cause and make contributions, positive contributions, that is very good serves your purpose. Sigma, we only have a few minutes left. <coughs> Thank you so much for your time. Um, my personal reverence to you is that what, what I see is when you're close to Gyalongpache, you have mm -hmm. so much respect or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I see that, that's like that's emotional for me. In a few sentences, Sigma. What does Gyalongpache mean to you? He is our North Star, he is our guiding light. Uh, there are so many uh, refugees in this world. We are only 130,000. There are so many, even Hong Kong guys, they have 100,000 people who will vote in English UK uh, uh, elections. Mm -hmm. So, he, despite our strength, it's because of his holiness that the Dalai Lama in the last 63 years and more years to go, it is because of him that there's cause of Tibet still continues. Mm -hmm. If it is not because if it is not him, then we would I don't know where would where yeah. we would have been. Mm -hmm. So his holiness is our beacon, he's our guiding light, he's our North Star, he, he represents everything. Yeah. And because of him uh, we are here. Yeah. So in that sense, if it is not for his holiness we would not be it. Yeah. Then if if we just go back a little bit and say the time when His Holiness arrived on Indian soil on 31st March 1959. Just before that, we had only a few Tibetans, maybe a few hundreds in Kalimpong and Darjeeling area. They were also be almost ready to be sent back to Tibet. So when the news arrived that His Holiness uh, had reached the Indian soil, then they were allowed to stay back. So, even at that time, if it had not been his holiness, there would not be an exile community. If there is no exile community, there would not be a struggle like how we are doing it. And so all this, and uh, even the Uyghur says, Tibetans have had no body. They have body but no head. So 
it is because of his holiness that we are here. Even now I say when I travel around the world, meet people and get some respect from them, it is not because of my achievement. It is something that his holiness has sown over the years and now is the time for us to reap yes. that fruit. Yes. Yeah. And likewise, I think I've met a few youngsters, I'm a youngster myself. I think within all of us there is that sense of responsibility or lenge, as you've mentioned. Um, but sometimes, of course, life happens, we forget. But what can we do, the young, younger generation, to do to bring about his holiness's message of compassion and love and um, you know, overall to them cause? What can we do specifically? First, we have to learn. Without learning uh, the, the contextual points, it's not possible for you to speak. So first, understand about Tibet. What are the historical part of Tibet also? That's why I say these days, when I speak to youngsters, if there are 120 children, if five of them read Michael's Tibet Brief 2020 or Shagopaya's or Tseng Shagya's book, I would be happy. Mm -hmm. Because what are these reading lists again? Yeah, One, like history part. History, okay. Yeah, uh, history part. Because uh, yeah, Michael's uh, Tibet Brief 2020 and one more book will come out in English at uh, first, the Lao Han Times. Because Michael's book is uh, his approach was since much of the Western world depend on China for it, it, East Asian history and that was also distorted. Uh, Michael went around Tibet. Mm -hmm. He met with so many scholars, some 70, 80 scholars over seven, eight years uh, in, in Asia. And then he wrote this book called Tibet Region. Oh. And he proves that whether it's Tibet Yuan relation, Tibet Ming relation, Tibet Qing relation, or as per international law today, Tibet has never been considered part of China. And the Chinese professor took a totally different approach. He looked at only imperial Chinese historical records. And he proved beyond doubt that imperial China, if you can consider the Manchus and Yuan also as Chinese, they have never considered Tibet as part of China. So from historical perspective, it's very important we know and we preserve this history that Tibet used to be an independent country. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we are going for middle way because we are looking mm -hmm. more at common interests. We are looking also at the possibility of winning over the uh, very strong opponent. Yeah, so we have 7 million and they are 1.4 billion. So we have to take all the reality into consideration and see what is the best course. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and thank you for giving me this uh, opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Can you want to yeah. wrap us up? It's, so really, it's very important that we reach out to the younger generations of Tibetans. You know, we call this holiness power jealousy. And jealousy has thousand hands and thousand eyes. And his holiness used to, in the form of, uh, as an emanation of jealousy, he travels around, travels around the world and gains so much support for mm -hmm. Now his holiness is aging and he's not able to travel as much as he used to. Yeah. Now every single one of us, the younger generation, has to be one eye or one hand of jealousy. Yeah. So if all of us can come together, there will be unity, there will be yeah. purpose, okay. there will be fruit. Yeah. We will do that. Result. We will. Yeah. We will so much yeah. And just to end it off really quickly, um, we like to end off Pija with a special quote from Yarambachin. So what's your favorite Yarambachin quote, if you have any? Uh, this, this it's not only from uh, his holiness, but the uh, uh, the 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 if the, the I said the same thing. It's a very small, just one one stanza, but it gives you a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. See, if there is a problem that you know there is a solution, why worry? Mm -hmm. If there is a problem you know there is no immediate solution, why worry? Mm -hmm. So it's like going to the airport, you know you are getting late, you will not be able to take, catch that flight. Yeah. So either you should have left early mm -hmm. or you should have considered all the things. But sometimes, even without reason, even without your uh, apprehension, things happen accidentally, get stuck or you know something like that. And you cannot do anything. And if you shout at the driver, the driver will also get angry. He might also try to find some ways and then there may be accident, it might get worse. Yeah. So you know that you are not able to reach there on time. So think about the next step, rebook or, you know, yeah. instead of you know, making everybody around you tense. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that, that's a simple thing. This is how you, and it, even when 
I think CNN's this doctor Sanjay Gupta, Sanjay and he was meditating with Solanus also. You leave the problem aside, then think over this. Mm -hmm. If you keep the problem on your head like a big bondage, mm -hmm. then it becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. If you can watch it from afar and then try to think about solution, then it helps better. Mm -hmm. That's what his holiness always says. I like more analytical meditation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much Thank for inspiring all of us. Thank, Thank you. you. No, Thank you so for taking the initiative. It's really useful. It means a lot to us. Thank you. Okay. Yes.